Hi, so we're here today with Darren Springer, who is the authority on um, the stones that were found in Cornwall and much, much more. So I'm going to let Darren introduce himself and tell us a bit about yourself and, and what research lines you go down. Well, thank you, Tar, for the opportunity to share with you. Uh, my name is Darren Springer, also known as Darren LeBaron. Um, I actually have a background in event organisation, working with people, young people in particular, in horticulture, food growing and creative arts. But, um, I've had a lifelong passion of African history and culture, um, which led me to working with some of the you know, leading pioneers and researchers I would like to think in our, in, in, in our midst. And um, they inspired me to kind of start doing my own research. And you know, one of the big you know, inspirations, people like Renoko Rashidi, he used to, you know, he still shares a lot about, you know, the African presence, the early African presence in the Americas, in Europe. And, you know, we introduced a lot of information in regards to the Moors and the Moorish, you know, empire, plus a lot more. And these were some of the things that inspired me to want to look into my own heritage, you know, being first generation born in the UK by way of the Caribbean ancestry of connecting me back to the, you know, to the motherland. I was always curious how that trail happened and took place. and you know, growing up, you know, I was always under the impression that we came over here, you know, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, during the wind rush and, you know, the byproducts of all of that. And, you know, that was pretty much it. And um, I was never taught anything else, you know, until I got pretty much into adulthood, started doing my own research. And, you know, and then I came across the likes of Renaco Rashidi, people like Robin Walker, I know who you're familiar with, and others that were bringing, you know, more of that information that was relative to the European obviously being in the European continent, I'm like, okay, so how does that tie in with our story? And that's kind of what just started me on my journey, like just taking that research seriously and wanting to know, you know, my family from Barbados, you know, how did they learn to speak English? Where's that accent from? You know, just little things like that that just spurred my interest in doing my research. And I really appreciate the introduction, but I would like to say, you know, I'm a humble grassroots researcher, not so much of an authoritative on, on the stones as some people may think or feel, but I definitely, you know, that's my interest and I've done, you know, I've done my Googles and done some research on that. Well, I know I came um, uh, on the trip with you last year. Was it last year or the year before? The year before, yeah, the year before. God, yeah, time goes fast. Um, and to me, you opened my eyes to a lot um, that was going on down there. We saw a lot of objects and, and you know, it was, a, it was a real kind of lesson, a learning curve on what we had here. Um, so if you could tell us a little, just a little bit about what we, what we were looking at when we were down there. Sure. So, you know, we went to Cornwall, obviously, which, um, you know, I had, a, I had several interests in Cornwall previously, but collectively we went there to check out the ancient sites as well as just the historical references that connect the oldest parts of the UK to ancient Africa, you know, ancient Africa. And, um, you know, um, as far as the migrations of people from the continent um, over to these lands you know um it happened pre rinrush there was some stuff that was happening pre rinrush from what I, from what i discovered and then that led me to just see well what are the earliest migrations we can find of non europeans let's say because it didn't at the time what we're gathering is that the land masses weren't referred to as the land masses I may not even look the way that they were in, in, in the times that we're currently dealing with but if we're just looking at you know who were the earliest people to migrate from you know other places to this place you know you follow the trail to what even the historians from this this country say and they you know they direct you to you know ancient Egypt primarily you know that's where some of the recent like I say the recent uh, research lies and then you can go back even further to when we're talking about prehistory and you know there's talks or references of the oldest people that we can find in the UK, you know, in these lands, um, you find them in that West Country, you know, the oldest history comes from that West Country. So, you know, Cornwall being the southern, most southerly and westerly part of the country and all along that coast, you know, Wales, Ireland and Scotland, they have a rich history and a wealth of ancient um, knowledge that predates the English Empire, you know, the British, they actually have a history where they fought the British hold on to their identity and to their culture so again you know me growing up i thought well welsh english irish they're all the same you know they're all european people they're all you know white people that was how i kind of grew up understanding it but they had this history that they was very proud of and that's what set off my curiosity and when i delved into their own story they actually had claims that they were 
kind of like custodians of information by way of the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Phoenicians. You know, and in particular, Cornwall has this history where they make reference to the ancient Phoenicians, you know, which we would say, you know, is the Middle East, North African kind of regions or Babylonian regions as we refer to today or, you know, modern day Iraq, Iran, those regions and ancient Africa. And they've got, you know, a, a history of trading with these people, you know, exchanging tin and copper and various other precious metals and so forth. And I was like, I've never heard of this in my life. And that was really the big thing that got me going as to what was there and what's in these places. And you find these records of the so-called pygmies or the Twa or the Aka, the Baka tribes that we refer to them today. These groups of small people that migrated over to this part of the world prehistory. And what history suggests is that there's not many other people apart from these small people or as Geoffrey of Monmouth reported, African giants would be responsible for creating some of these historical things that we find in these parts of the world. So that was what kind of spurred my interest is into finding out that the most ancient stone sites in the United Kingdom, in fact, actually, according to their carbon dating, predate the pyramids, you know, in, in, in ancient Egypt. And I was like, what? But then they were suggesting that they were built by Africans according to the European historians. So I was like, wow, that was, you know, a kind of what opened my eyes and ears and everything else to wanting to find out more. So that's what kind of got us there. And there was a lot more connections, obviously, with ancient Egypt in particular that I focused on because that's where there's a wealth of information available and documented. And, and what are the links, um, you know, what visually when we're looking at this, how do we know that, the, or, or how, how, what, what brings us to think that they are the same as what we're, what we're seeing in Africa? those stones that we that that were out there you know so if i'll be honest you know i can't sit here and say i can be 100 percent sure you know what we're looking at is just a consciousness we're dealing with certain knowledge and information that these groups of people had access to now it's one of two things they either met or exchanged or traded with people who shared that information with them or they had, they were able to access that information by, you know, divine, by div divination or divine order, so to speak. But what we find is a common thread, you know, and certain names that come up. So perfect example being that in Cornwall, it's named Cornwall, you know, and it's named after a corn god, you know, and it was a god of vegetation. And this corn god, you could, um, it you know, it ties into all the deities, but if you follow the trail, this corn god identifies with a corn god that we have in ancient Egypt, who would be known, commonly known as Osiris, the god of vegetation. So this place in Cornwall has these connections with these ancient deities that have exactly or pretty much the same characteristics as the ancient Egyptian archetypes. And when you have mythologies that deal with Osar being the god of the West or the Westerner, and that he would return, and then you have these traditions in Cornwall, and Cornwall being the most westernly place that we have in the UK, and it's the oldest place where they've kept, you know, they're the, as I would like to think, they're the custodians of this ancient information. And then when you get to the, the speak to the local people who would, you know, some of them refer to them as Druids, they deal with the ancient Kemetan or Egyptian practices and understandings. So you've got the ancient remnants there which is up for debate you know so it's really questionable because we can't prove it but the people who claim to be descendants of these these europeans will also say that they have these connections to ancient egypt and then when you see the original druids today to this day they dress up in ancient egyptian regalia you know so these are the connections i've made yeah I think that was one of the interesting things for me because we were um, going around there. We, they've got this rich her heritage with witches and gods and those kind of things. And, and you could clearly yeah. see the links yeah. um, uh, within, within those as well. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about that, that side of things? Sure. So, um, you know, like you're dealing with... Um, certain traditions that go beyond, um, you know, the, the religious kind of teachings where they're looking at, like, as you know, we was there, we was looking at the, the so-called pagan or Druid traditions, and they have their deities, and one of them basically, they wrap up into a mummy form, and it's, they use it as an actual, it's like a psychedelic herb, in fact, and they use it in their rituals and ceremonies, and they wrap it up as a mummy, and they actually refer to it as Osiris, 
and they utilize it as a way of communicating with these natir, as we refer to the natiru, or in their regards that you know the deities that they work with. And when you follow the priesthood as well as the priestesshood, they both tie in directly with the deity Ptah from ancient Egypt, who was the mound, you know, the the you know the uh, the foundations of the Egyptian mystery systems, you know, of the, the pre-dynastic period. And in the latter period, you've got the goddess Isis, or Beti et Oset. And both the priesthood and the um, priestesshood is what later became those, you know, those witchcraft places, what, what you find in, in, those, you know, in those parts of the world. And when they talk about the witches and the pagans and the green men and the leprechauns, all of these things tie in with these, the knowledge that was gleaned from this priesthood, priesthood and priestesshood that comes out of ancient Egypt, primarily the priesthood of Ptah and the priestesshood of Isis. And you find remnants of that throughout Europe. Yeah, I mean, it, I just, you know, when being there and seeing those links and understanding it was really kind of eye opening. Now, um, with the ones that we saw in, in Cornwall, are there any links that you found to Stonehenge? Um, so the links are basically the people who are from those places do not know how those stones arrived there. And they all say that it was an earlier group or earlier groups that built those or gifted these, these things to them. So, um, the links with Stonehenge directly is that, um, well, not with the, the, in, the indirect links is that basically Cornwall was actually a, a, a lot older. It's a lot older than, than Stonehenge itself. Um, and the people I would like to think basically migrate, just like the Nile Valley civilization kind of made its way up. And as it moved up, it developed and became more sufficient and more sustainable and more specific to what they were getting out of these stone sites. I think it's the same within, you know, the English tradition. As it makes its way from the West over towards the East, you see that there's a development of the stone sites and what was actually achieved. So the ones that you find in Cornwall are really simple compared to when you come look at Stonehenge as this large site. But the rituals and the customs associated with the Cornish traditions very much tie into, you know, what we would call, you know, the occult or the esoteric practices that you would find in ancient Africa. It's, you know, pretty much like the voodoo, as some people were taught, you know, would deal with it. That's what the English traditions were. So these stone sites have all these mystical associations with them. You know, of like, we, I think we went to the Merry Maidens. It was all to do with these stone circles casted out in a particular in a particular setting. But when you hear the modern version of it, you know, from the Christian with the Christian spin, they would say, "Oh, these nineteen maidens, these nineteen virgins, went out and danced in this field on a Sunday when you're not, you know, and you're not meant to dance on the day of God and have fun and so forth." So God struck them down and turned them into stone. But when you deal with the people from those regions, they have more mystical meanings and understandings. And a lot of them, they refer to them as kind of like portal type places where you would go and commune with the ancestors. You would go and commune with the deities. And, you know, later as Christianity was introduced in these regions, they introduced like basically churches were established on these, these same sites in the same areas. And then because it had this history of being these pagan type places, they kind of demonized them. But at the same time, they were con considered you know power plate you know places of power sacred spaces so yeah that's kind of the stuff that's going on in cornwall but in stonehenge it became more developed and people would suggest that it hasn't again some people say it's a clock ties in with you know a calendar some people say it's an air burial place it's a you know it's a cemetery so again it's all up for discussion but what we do know is that it predates the people who are currently saying that they're from these lands and places and they acknowledge and admit that they were not the builders of these places then when we check history there's only a handful of groups that were around in these days and times they could potentially be according to what history says and you know again like i said during that time we've got remnants of stories of either small people from africa you know the so-called pygmies or african giants that's what keeps coming up when, it, when, you, when you delve into these into those mysteries okay thank you very much for giving us that insight into what you found down there now i know that you are doing you, you do regular visits and tours down to cornwall as well um when's your next one i couldn't tell you man it's meant to be it's meant to be stuff happening now in this you know in the fall I and mean, in autumn but because of the current climate i'm not too sure i'd love to think that in the spring we always do one in the spring we try to get one in the summer and one towards the end of the year like october because there's certain festivals and ceremonies that take place that it's always good to go and tap so, into so so where can people get hold of you 
Yo, man, you just need to check me out. My website's darrenlebaron.com. I'm on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and either of those platforms. You can follow me, like, subscribe, and then be kept up to date with all my upcoming events, workshops, right. and retreats and stuff. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for being here with us this evening. Now, you're also going to be part of the um, panel discussion that we've got coming up later. So we'll look forward to hearing some more insights from you. Looking forward to it, Tara. Thank you. Okay, so thank you.